T3, that was Melissa Scott, widow of Jean Scott, who I remember as the late night cigar smoking, whiteboard scribbling preacher who would cut to scenes of scantily clad ladies riding horses along wooden fences as part of his TV preaching broadcast. These young ladies would also attend his services sitting in the front row. They were nicknamed the Pony Girls, and as the story goes, I could be wrong about this, Melissa at one time was one of those girls. And after Jean's death in 2005, Melissa took over as pastor at the Faith Center in Glendale, California. She has continued Jean Scott's tradition of requiring reservations to attend the private services while also mimicking Jean's whiteboard wackiness. Melissa's background is rather controversial, and I choose to leave it to others to investigate. <clears throat> what I want to do is look at some things she says about the book of James and you them to clear up some common mis misconceptions uh, about, well, most likely the earliest book in the New Testament. But before I do that, I want to relate a story I heard recently from a non-Christian friend who attended a Christmas party hosted by his wife's friends who attend, um, well, they say they attend church regularly and profess faith in Christ. Uh, there's a, a quote here from C.S. Lewis. Um, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. <laughs> now, here's the story. My friend went to this party with his wife. They get there, and uh, they somehow didn't know it was a pajama party, so they felt out of place right away. It was a uh, Christmas pajama party, I guess. And right away they were offered uh, various kinds of alcohol. Now, my friend happens to be a uh, soda pop connoisseur. He doesn't drink diet, and that's all they had. So I think he ended up drinking a light beer, but didn't really want to. And so um, what happened during the evening is they kept going on tirades about the current uh, federal government and the uh, chief of uh, the federal government and uh, came to the point after drinking for some time, um, doing uh, either lip syncing or karaoke of some kind. And then during that, one of the, uh, the hosts picked up a, a megaphone and was shouting, uh, F uh, President Biden. They were also doing jello shots, um, and they were playing a game, I think it was outside, I think it's called Pajanga, or something like that, where you pull out pieces, and it was one of those big games, and, and every time you blew it and something fell, I believe he said uh, you were required to actually drink a shot of alcohol. Now, you've probably heard of the question, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, if those hosting that party were judged solely by their behavior that particular night, well, they probably wouldn't be convicted. Now, thanks be to God, uh, we're not judged by our behavior on a single uh, day or event. And we must remember, it's not our moral improvement that saves us as Christians. It is trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in our place. That's what saves a Christian. So why are then good works important? Well, they're important because Jesus not only redeems Christians from the pit, but also renews Christians by his Holy Spirit to be conformed to his image so that the lives of Christians will display true gratitude to God for all his benefits and also that Christians will, by the fruit and good works that proceed from true faith, be used of God as he sees fit to draw others to saving faith in Jesus Christ. There is an individual here on social media that says they've been watching me for a couple of years. Could you please explain your problems with the book of James? <laughs> Okay, now she wouldn't be alone in people that have problems with the book of James. Uh, I mean, many have thought, including the reformer Martin Luther, that the book of James was of less value than other of the books of the New Testament because it seemed to contradict the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. 
And on its face, it kind of does seem that way. I mean, compare James 2.24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. However, the Bible does not contradict itself, and I contend that both Paul and James are in agreement on what it is that actually saves a person from their sin. I don't have any problems with the book of James. Simply put, um, if you compare the book of James to the other books of the Bible, you find that, of the New Testament, you find that James is a little out of sync. And there's a reason for that. As I've said publicly, he did not follow Jesus during Jesus' public ministry. In fact, we know that his mother and the rest of his family tried to put him away. They thought he was crazy. So if you didn't follow Jesus um, in that day, you probably wouldn't really know what he said and what he taught. Now, that's a very strange argument indeed. I mean, couldn't the same be said of the Apostle Paul? Did he follow Jesus during his earthly ministry? I mean, hardly. In fact, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he did his level best to snuff out the Jesus movement before his encounter with the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. James indeed was a skeptic during the ministry of his half-brother, as we would see in John 7, verse 5. But that all changed after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul gives an account of the eyewitnesses who saw Jesus after he was raised and glorified, and guess who he mentions? 1 Corinthians 15. That specifically includes James in the list. Galatians 1. Paul tells of going up to Jerusalem after three years in Arabia to visit Peter. And when, the, uh, and when he did this, he saw no other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And then in Galatians 2, Paul states that he met with James, Peter, and John and was given the right hand of fellowship. So to say that James didn't know the greatness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus is more than a little perplexing. There is a great uh, discrepancy between most of the New Testament books and James. But how can that be? If God the Holy Spirit commissioned the apostles and their associates to write what the church would come to recognize as the New Testament canon or standard of God's revealed word, then how can there be any discrepancy between the book of James and all the other historical books, epistles, and the revelation of John that comprise the New Testament? Uh, it, it, it simply cannot be. James, James tends to focus more on a, um, we'll call it a Jewish platform. A Jewish platform? <laughs> What does that mean? Uh, James begins his general letter. Right? It's called one of the general letters of the New Testament. He, he, he begins it this way. To the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Now, don't let the 12 tribes throw you here. James is not writing to unconverted Jewish people scattered about, but rather Christians who are at the same time, you know, most likely of Jewish descent. We know he is addressing Christians by what he says in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Which goes on to track very closely with what Paul will write sometime later in Romans chapter 5. Uh, James makes no mention of the temple or the keeping of ceremonial laws, or the Sabbath, or feast days. In fact, he only quotes from the Old Testament three times in the entire letter. What is infused in James' letter are illusions, many illusions, of the teachings of Jesus, which Melissa claims he didn't know about. For instance, John 15, 19, Jesus says, If you were of the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. He's saying that to his disciples. Now listen to what James writes. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, who wants, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's just one of many parallels that we find in the book of James which tends to look at works and things that the rest of the New Testament does not support. 
James is writing to Jewish Christians who were in the environs of Palestine and Syria. These new Christians were up against those who rejected Christianity, who were hostile towards it, and were suffering as a result. Which is why James begins his letter encouraging them to endure hardships and persecution. These people were tempted to make friends with the world, as we Christians are today. It's no different. To avoid being outcasts. And because of this, James stays very practical and gives many more imperatives than doctrinal indicatives. There are some things we can glean out of that book, so I would never say don't read it or throw it away, but understand that some things we can glean? I mean, what about 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. Uh, the bulk of our Catholic friends, for example, they lean heavily on that book. That is a book that, in fact, if you talk to a lot of people, they go to James first. And that's exactly the problem. <laughs> Okay, now that's true. I mean, uh, Roman Catholics will lean heavily on James, I suppose, uh, because they think it's faith plus works that saves you. Um, that's not true. And if you went to uh, Paul in Galatians, uh, he goes into great depth and gets very angry with the Galatians for beginning to drift that way. But how about this supposed contradiction between Paul saying that a man is justified by faith apart from works and James saying that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. How can these two statements be harmonized? Well, it's really not hard to understand if one simply looks at the context. Okay, in the case of James, he is troubled that new Christians, new Jewish Christians for the most part, are shrinking back from their new life in Christ and behaving in ways not consistent with the teachings of Christianity. Kind of like the people giving shots and saying bad things about the current government, who I may or may not disagree with. I disagree with. <clears throat> James tackles the problem of preferential treatment of the rich over the poor, the problem of unchristian like speech, quarrels and conflicts among brethren, and worldly thinking. He tackles all that stuff. So then James says a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, he's not talking about the justification that saves a person, but rather admonishing these people who hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, James 2 verse 1, to confirm their saving faith by the lives they live and the good works that spring forth from the saving faith that Paul preaches so much. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. And then he goes on, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, Paul and James are on the same page. When James says, prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers who deceive themselves, James is, James is not saying anything different than what, what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. It begins, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? <laughs> Far be it! How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we may walk in newness of life. Doers of the word and not just hearers. It starts somewhere else. James is for people who actually have read the Bible and can see the difference between the rest of the New Testament and James and recognize, as Martin Luther said, it's a stry little epistle, and I would say just a little change on what he said, a slight variant. There is very little, he said there is none. There is very little gospel contained in it. Hmm. Okay. So, 
The, the book of James was not intended uh, by, by James, the writer, to provide a comprehensive theological treatise on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the foundation of the gospel and the consummation of all things beginning with the return of Jesus Christ in glory is there for all to see. James 1 verse 18. In the exercise of his will, God's electing grace, he gave us birth regeneration by the Holy Spirit, by the word of truth, the gospel, so that we would be a kind of first fruits, you know, new creation following the risen Christ, who is the true first fruits among his redeemed creatures. Now that sounds an awful lot like Ephesians 1 verse 13. And in him, having heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And then we can look at Romans uh, 13, verse 11. And do this, understanding the occasion. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now compare that with James 5, verse 8. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near.